So hi everybody, welcome to session number 5000. Is that it? I've been of the Innovation Cafe. Uh, we are here today to learn a bit more, a bit further about how to test business ideas thing, but not just how to test business ideas, but it seems that there are platforms to manage how we do this uh, in our organizations. So today we have an expert in the room, I, I will say. Um, I'm still trying to learn how to pronounce your name. Is it G Gaurav, Sony? Yeah, that's, per that's perfect. That's perfect, fine. Yeah. Uh, Gaurav is the co-founder of uh, Lean, uh, Lean Apps, uh, and he will tell us everything about himself, the company, uh, and how we can innovate in a much smarter way. So over to you, and thanks for your, for your time. Yeah, thanks, Hugo, and uh, appreciate that. Uh, give us the opportunity to speak here and uh, great so yeah i think my partner is also joined now so my name is gaurav and uh, i think some of the people i see they are connected uh, with me on linkedin there are some team members as well so great uh, uh six years back uh, with my partner Najit. he's also in the call and uh, <laughs> so the company started with a vague idea the, the, the whole intent of starting the company was to leave our jobs and uh, start something. And that's how our journey started. Uh, so we are brothers as well. And it was very easy, uh, comfortable to start the journey together. So we started building products for some of the companies we knew. And uh, and yeah, that's how the journey started. We grew and uh, we had a couple of failures, which I'll talk today, uh, where we got a, uh, you know, uh, uh, in between we wanted to build some product. We went in, what a, we made a lot of mistakes. I think with that learning, this uh, innovation bug uh, uh, got us uh, only two years back, where we started working with the buyer through one of our uh, partners, and we got into uh, this innovation stuff. And with with our learning, of course, uh, with our failures, uh, now we could easily correlate uh, uh, that what were the what were the things that we did wrong, what most of the start uh, innovation teams do. Where, uh, where nine of the ten, uh, nine of nine of ten ideas fail. So I'm gonna uh, be very practical today, informal, uh, share some uh, experiences that we had uh, while working with innovation teams, how we failed when we did, did our own startup, and yeah. So let's see how it goes, and yeah. Then I think I'll try to wrap it up in uh, 20 minutes, 20 25 minutes, and then we can have uh, informal session with the team as well. Perfect. So. Uh, shall I share my screen, Hugo? Yes, please go ahead. We have around 30 people waiting, so let, let's go. Okay. Perfect. Cool. Just a second, I think. Uh, give me a second. Cool. So can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. So yeah, thanks Hugo for uh, giving this opportunity to talk uh, on this topic, which is very close to our hearts. And uh, thanks everyone for joining in. <laughs> my name is Gaurav and I have my partner Najit uh, and my team, uh, Pavel, Ruchir, Devansh in the call. So there's a lot of stuff uh, in the market uh, around innovation. <laughs> you know, people talk about AI, lean startup, lean innovation, design thinking, design sprint. Uh, when it comes to idea validation and some of these uh, terms are confusing uh, for innovation teams <laughs> and uh, while while they want to choose uh, one strategy to uh, work on uh, new ideas in fact one of the innovation managers asked a very uh, <laughs> interesting question a couple of weeks back when i was talking uh, whatever you're talking eventually all the roads leads to leads to rome so what road should i choose while validating my idea so I think what's important is uh, most of the people choose the toughest path, which they think it's the easiest one, where they start building the product and then go to the market to validate. Rather, we, have, we should find a way, a road that helps us reach Rome in the fastest way possible with the minimum uh, toll tax. And today we'll uh, discuss about how we can validate our ideas, uh, which comes uh, through without building a product. And something uh, which we have been implementing uh, with Strategizer and AFCE. These are our partners uh, at uh, Fire. So, what the agenda, what's the agenda today? So, we'll talk about how we can structure and come out uh, with the most critical assumptions 
about uh, the idea through assumptions when framing with the PF created. So we'll learn how to convert assumptions to testable hypotheses. We'll go through some marketing hacks to generate evidence around all the assumptions and hypotheses. And everyone <coughs> will get free access uh, to all the frameworks and canvases uh, we have prepared, created uh, last year uh, as a team uh, to scale up the innovation journey. So let's start. Uh, so <coughs> this is one of uh, the slides that I showed. Uh, this you would have seen everywhere. Why? The nine out of 10 ideas fail. Now, for an idea to succeed, uh, multiple assumptions need to validate, get validated and validated before you can uh, say that this is a successful idea or a failure. Uh, uh, in our uh, <coughs> discussions, we usually talk to eight to 10 innovation teams in a week. And I think every team, most of them, uh, I would say nine out of 10, uh, believe that their idea is amazing. I have not seen any innovation team saying, oh, my idea is a crap idea. And, uh, and it's bound to succeed. Uh, but when we get into other discussions, most of them, you know, are talking about solution, implementation, technology, launching the product. Everyone has, they really want to launch the product fast. And nobody uh, talks about customer segment and the problems they're solving. The sad part is uh, no one want to uh, go the easy way to validate the idea before building it. So I think as humans, we love uh, doing hard work. We love building things. We are stuck in the build trap. And uh, all of us, I think we are somehow uh, by God gift great uh, at executing things and we love it. So what's the recipe for failure? Uh, you have seen the recipe for success, but we've got to talk about the uh, recipe of failure today. So what's common in these nine, uh, 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 what do you call the, you know, the nine, uh, what, are, what, what is a common pattern uh, in all these startups that fail? So usually they start with a killer idea with a lot of passion in mind. Uh, idea starts with a solution with a vague definition of customer segment and problems. They do a lot of market research, go through reports from McKinsey, EY, from, which gives a global perspective, look for similar products in the market. Now, based on the market research, you do some maths on Excel and come out with fancy business plans. Uh, you also go to, and talk to your customers uh, or prospects which will never say no to, uh, which will, of course, not say no to you. Uh, secure funding, uh, assemble the uh, team and start execution. Now, this keeps the team busy for five to six months to build their first MVP, launch it. And then, you know, the, the approach is, okay, let's pump in money uh, into marketing and acquire customers. And by the time uh, everyone gets emotional, emotionally attached to the product, and in some months after the launch, they get to know that no one is interested in the idea. And this is a pattern that has been, uh, you know, across uh, industries, across verticals, when it comes to building the new products. I want to share a story about uh, a product which we built on our assumptions and our, in our dream world, which eventually failed. Uh, the dreams are very costly for us. So we invested around 100,000 euros building a product for restaurants and retail. And the idea, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and the learning was like very costly in terms of our money and time. Uh, it was the same, uh, you know, challenge that we got emotionally attached to the product, the idea, and uh, we didn't want to quit. We knew that we are failing. Uh, we knew there were signals that were not uh, giving us a positive sign. The problem existed in the market, but we realized very late that people are not willing to pay for that. And the customer segment for us was too big. In fact, one of the partners uh, continued uh, to stay in the dream world and decided to go solo, but we decided to quit. Uh, so I think. After today's session, I want at least everyone to take uh, uh, an oath uh, that, yeah, we will not build anything, uh, hold our emotions, and focus on validating all our assumptions before we invest even a single penny building the product. Now, <laughs> this is an innovation funnel uh, we follow with uh, different teams uh, across uh, different uh, innovation uh, agent companies we work with. So the step one starts with uh, collecting ideas at the company level. Uh, and filter them uh, based on the strategic fit. The second step is to validate your assumptions and hypotheses. Uh, this is where we'll focus today, and uh, this is where you have this uh, plethora of marketing hacks and experiments that you can test with. Uh, then you build your prototype, uh, uh, you validate your idea or solution using design sprint, and the last step is where you uh, uh, start building your first version of the product. So let's start with the first agenda for today, how to structure the most critical assumptions. 
So what's assumption? So assumption. So we'll. So this is what we've created is assumption sprint. Now that helps you to uh, structure your uh, ideation process. So the framework will help you define and filter your most critical assumptions that can make or break your idea. So what's an assumption? Assumption uh, is a general feeling about a business problem or a customer segment or a solution. It is your belief uh, about how the target market or the customer segment uh, will engage with your idea. So there could be multiple assumptions, uh, like does your customer segment really care about the problem? Do they have uh, any alternatives to resolve the problem? Are they willing to spend enough money to solve the problem? How much are they willing to pay? Are they willing to learn, adapt it, uh, recommend it to their friends, and use it again and again? So this is a step-by-step -step process we have created uh, uh, to run an assumption sprint. So you start uh, defining with constraints, uh, collect the problems that uh, you have and the customer segment you want to focus on. So you vote on the problems and the customer segment you want to validate. <laughs> convert them into we believe statements. So we'll go with some examples as well in upcoming slides. Uh, filter the ones that are very critical for your idea. So criticality here is that if this assumption fails, then my idea is bound to fail. And at the end of the assumption sprint, we collect uh, a lot of we believe that statements for which uh, there is zero uh, to no evidence. And the goal is to take these assumptions and then test it uh, before you build it. So we start with uh, defining the constraints. So this is very important and we realized uh, in our conversations, in our uh, internal uh, meetings when we were trying to ideate uh, for our marketing strategy, that uh, why constraints are important. That's how this, uh, this, this whole thing came together. So when there are no constraints uh, or boundaries, we call it in the idea generation process, usually people uh, uh, go with their most intuitive idea based on their gut feel that comes in the mind. Uh, it, it, of course, everybody is creative. They want to put their whole idea on the table, but uh, the ideas are unfocused. Sometimes they, are, they have no strategic fit. They're not aligned to the company vision or uh, don't, have, don't have clear outcomes. Now, it becomes challenging for innovation teams uh, uh, to decide what idea or the problem uh, they want to test for it, uh, first. And this ends up generating a lot of random and unfocused ideas. So here are some of the examples uh, which can be used as references to uh, create or set up constraints so that the teams who are, who, who, who are working together, so there will be innovation teams, there will be uh, uh, companies helping innovation teams to build ideas. Uh, so they can use this uh, to set constraints before you start uh, using assumption sprints and uh, which gives a direction uh, to people while uh, you know dealing with problems of the customer segment. So yeah, you can go through the examples later. We'll share the, uh, the presentation. So the second step, uh, which is very important here is the problem with the customer. Uh, and this is a very important step. Uh, uh, looks very easy, but more, we have seen a lot of teams fumbling here. So customer segments are generally vague. Problem statements, when they're articulated, uh, they are more like solutions. So <laughs> this is my favorite slide. So we call this a growth box. So what we have done is we have divided the whole thing into four quadrants. Uh, so before you deep dive into defining a customer segment or the problems objectively, so decide on what you want to focus on. This is also kind of part of constraint. Uh, and this brings a common focus to the team uh, so that the ideas generated will be very focused on a specific quadrant. So it could be uh, with the existing customers. So you're dealing with the existing customers, you want to deal with the new customer segment, or you're dealing with the completely uh, new customer segment, with the new problems. So you can pick and choose and then decide uh, where you want to focus while generating ideas. Uh, this is uh, where we have created uh, our canvases for problem and customer segment. So there are very specific questions uh, that you can answer. Uh, some of the things you will know, some of the things which you will not know, but this is where uh, you will have, uh, you, you will start answering these questions, specific questions around the problem, the customer segment, which will eventually get converted uh, into your we believe statements and it will help you build your assumptions and they're free. So there are some of the examples uh, uh, which I wanted to highlight uh, around how to define the problem in the customer segment. So I know some people uh, feel, uh, might feel that yeah, yeah uh, this is so, so, so easy that uh, you know, you can define a problem in the customer segment, but uh, as I said in my last slide, that this is where a lot of teams uh, struggle. So in fact, I was uh, mentoring a team yesterday, 
So I'll not take the names, but they were <laughs> they were working on an idea to help farmers uh, use pesticides in the fields effectively to increase the productivity of the soil. And uh, when I asked them, okay, what's the customer segment? Uh, the answer was uh, farmers from uh, Europe and Asia Pacific. Now, <laughs> APAC and Europe are continents. They're not cafes that you can reach out to your target customers in a couple of weeks or months. Finally, after a lot of argument, they decided, okay, let's forget about continents, let's focus on uh, cities. And uh, in fact, I was still arguing that the cities are big. We have to really nail down maybe to a small place, uh, limited number of farmers, but I'm helping them slowly reach to a minimum testable market. Uh, so once you've defined your uh, problems, your customer segment, uh, uh, so this is where you start now voting for the problem in the customer segment. In fact, you know, everything is not important. So here as a team, you vote together and bring out uh, the most important ones that you want to focus on. Uh, make sure that there are not too many of them, uh, specifically when it comes to customer segments. So you try to, we'll take the examples in the coming slides, so how you can nail down and fix your customer segments initially when you and uh, this is this is the next step where you prioritize uh, the top voted problems. So you start with the one that has got the maximum vote, uh, followed by the next one, and then uh, this is how you base your uh, you know your problems and customer segment. This is a step where you convert your uh, prioritized uh, uh, problems or customer segment into we believe statements. So here is an example. So this is uh, taken from uh, one of the workshops where the team was working on a, a retail product. Uh, to enhance the experience of uh, customers in store when they're buying uh, grocery stuff. So they wanted to see that our shoppers, the problem was our shoppers are frustrated uh, due to long waiting queues uh, for 20 minutes uh, at the checkout counter. Uh, a simple uh, is that you just say, okay, we believe that and you put the problem statement. Or it could be, uh, we, we, want, we have a product, we, have a, we are solving a problem for X customer segment, we want to focus on uh, now, uh, uh, taking it to the next customer segment or new customer segment. So you just say, okay, we believe that the, this product can fit for the new customer segment. Now, this is uh, uh, the, the most critical step where you start mapping all your assumptions into this quadrant. So the quadrant we call it is critical uh, and uh, known unknown. So this on the, on the Y axis, if you see this is, this goes from critical to non-critical. And uh, on the X axis, it's known to unknown. So what it says is that whatever assumptions you have, your goal is to filter out the most critical assumptions that are unknown. So critical and unknown assumptions are the areas which will be tested first uh, uh, when you validate uh, your, your ID. So <laughs> once you have your critical assumptions in place, uh, uh, which, are, which are critical and unknown, so we'll, let's see how you can convert them into a testable hypothesis. It was very confusing initially for me to uh, have a difference between uh, uh, the uh, the assumption and hypothesis, but after, after doing this exercise, I'm able to uh, articulate very clear definition of both. So <clears throat> this is where you convert uh, your we believe uh, statements uh, into hypothesis. So what is hypothesis? It's an educated guess or a prediction about uh, the relationship between two variables. It must be a testable statement something that you can support or falsify with your evidence. And this is not from me, this is what Wikipedia says. Uh, let's go through the example here. So I'm working on an idea, uh, which is still uh, in, in, the, in the validation phase to help uh, smokers in India quit smoking. So the idea is to build a breathing device for smokers who, can, uh, who want to quit smoking. So uh, the solution, uh, uh, should not be the talking solution, but when they breathe, in through the device, it will uh, give the indication of the quality of the lungs, uh, uh, which could be red, amber, or green, and bef uh, before they uh, go for the next move. So what's the assumption statement here? So what we believe uh, is that uh, we believe that the chain smokers in India who want to quit smoking would be interested in a reasonably priced uh, device to help them monitor their lungs. Now the statement, if you see, is vague. Uh, can it be tested? No. So if we have to convert them into a, a hypothesis, this is what we reach to. That if we believe that 30% of people living in Delhi who can uh, uh, who uh, who smoke more than 10 cigarettes a day will buy a hundred uh, euro device for to monitor the lungs and uh, quit smoking. Now, 
if you see the numbers here, so it says it says thirty percent of people in, in living in Delhi. So we reduce the target market now from India and focus and the focus is Delhi. Second, uh, what uh, is it? What it is is that we want to uh, say people uh, who who smoke more than ten cigarettes. The third thing what we did is we put a price to it, where we want to test that okay, how much are they willing to pay? Now, even if you look at the target market, uh, it's still big. So if, yeah, the population of uh, Delhi is close to 10 million. And if you take 10% of the population who smoke cigarettes, uh, uh, it will be like 1 million. So how do we uh, uh, reach and make our minimum testable uh, market? So that's where you go and do hyper zooming, uh, where you find your minimum viable. Uh, so you, you build your minimum viable hypothesis. You want to build the minimum market that you want to test. So in this step, uh, uh, we'll further hyper zoom and reduce the target market further. So let's, if you see five and six, so if you compare compare both of them uh, in six, it is still testable. So what you did, what we did is we said, okay, rather than going, uh, targeting the whole delivery, we'll target a hospital uh, where we can go to a pulmonologist where there are patients visiting uh, the doctor who are already suffering uh, from, uh, from the smoking addiction. And why don't we test and validate the idea quickly with them? So, while hyper zooming or while defining your minimum testable market, make sure that you don't zoom in so close that your subset of the target market becomes very small, five to 10 people uh, who are known to you. You should always be, uh, stay away from your relatives, friends. Uh, they are not your enemies, but problem is they're very close to you and they might not uh, uh, give you the right feedback because they would feel bad if uh, telling you the truth, if the idea is not uh, great. Uh, 100 to 1,000 uh, people, 1,000 is also a big range, but initially starting, say, we, so we tested with like 100 people over, over a week uh, is a good uh, initial number to uh, test your idea. So once you have everything, then the next stage is let's, uh, we get into the experiments. You have the minimum testable market, you know what, what you want to test. So now's the time to uh, choose your experiment from there. So here, uh, what you do is your first step is to, uh, Go with your critical assumption or hypothesis that you have seen in the last slide. So you choose one of the experiments from here, which could be a landing page, explain a video, or maybe a simple discovery interview. And so for us, we choose to do an interview with the smokers uh, for a week. And uh, our success criteria, which is step three, where you define that, okay, what is it? How will you measure the success, whether the experiment is successful or not? So we said if 30 patients out of 100 say that, yes, we want to buy the device, our hypothesis, uh, is correct will be correct uh, so step four is uh, now we didn't have a device we didn't have anything this was the first uh, discussion of the interview now how do we uh, get uh, if, the, if somebody says yes i'm interested in the device uh, how do you get his uh, skin in the game now that's where you uh, want to collect something from the from the from 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 the users that you're talking to so what we did is we collected their email address and phone number so that uh, they can uh, uh, we can call them, we can reach them when, when the product is out in the market. Uh, so similarly, you can have multiple other ways to collect something from them, uh, which which at least gives you some skin in the game. Uh, in terms of time boxing, this is very important. So we, uh, we time box the whole experiment for one week. And uh, of course, we extended it further to run multiple into different hospitals and different places. So uh, this is uh, our experiment menu. So here, here is the experiment menu uh, where you can, uh, uh, which you can use to validate uh, your hypothesis or your assumptions. So we have the link in the next slide, which covers the outcomes of the experiments. So you can download that from the presentation. So yeah, uh, I think from my experiment perspective, a lot, lot of time this question comes, uh, should I run one experiment? Should I run multiple experiments? So the maths uh, says that, uh, you uh, you cannot just rely on one experiment. So you need to run multiple experiments to really uh, arrive to a conclusion with uh, some evidence if the idea is really worth pursuing it or not. But uh, one good thing with experiments is that uh, uh, your decisions that you're taking are not uh, on gut feel, but it's data driven and uh, and of course you go with your gut, but uh, you you have data to to prove your gut. And you take the right, and you, of course, you take the right decision over a period of time. So this is the infographic that uh, we created for experiments, which explains uh, when to use what experiment and uh, what to measure. 
So depending on whether you are in the solution phase, you are at uh, the product uh, building a product market fit phase, you are in the phase of validating your customer segment or your uh, 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 your uh, <coughs> your customer segment or your problem. So you can decide and pick. So that's it for today. I really appreciate uh, you listening to the whole story. Let's stay in touch uh, via LinkedIn and Innovation Cafe. Uh, Slack channel. It's a great effort uh, put in by Google, and uh, yeah, great. So yeah, let's let's go to the questions. Great. I think it was a, a masterclass how to test uh, business ideas, also a resume of a lean startup uh, approach. But let's open the session for Q and A. And we have many people in the room today. Let's go, guys. Don't be shy. <laughs> Okay, so if nobody, the, the first question is always the hardest, right? But Steph, Steph, you are here. Steph is yeah, my no, no, exactly. Guys, thank you so much. That was absolutely fantastic. I really enjoyed it. And it was great to, to chat too. And also there's a lot of takeaways there for us to learn from. Um, okay, so I do have a question. Which which product and what which which discovery process and uh, you know what have been the outstanding uh, projects that you've worked on that have really stuck with you, but also you know you've done something good out of them. You've not just done the business work, but you've actually made a difference. Uh, sorry, Steph, you, can you can you repeat your question? Actually, the voice uh, was breaking in between, and I so, so have there been any outstanding projects that you guys have worked on that you feel have made an exponential difference? So it's not just about the business side of it, but it's about making a difference in people's lives. Yeah, I think there was one product that we built. Uh, uh, I, I won't be able to share the name of the uh, customer, of course, but because, because of the NDA. But uh, uh, that really changed people's lives because uh, it was built pre-COVID, where we were working uh, to uh, uh, increase the life expectancy of patients who go into, into ICU. The challenge is when the patients go into ICU, there is something called ARDS. It's a, it's a technical term, but uh, in a layman language, this is where you put on a ventilator and uh, your recovery chances are very less. And uh, then there is a lot of data stats for the doctors to decide what to do next with you. And, uh, and this is exactly the same condition which is happening for uh, COVID patients, though we were not doing, uh, we, 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 knew, we never knew that COVID is coming. However, that team, uh, that, that research or the product that we did really helped the team uh, to uh, deal with the COVID situation. So what, what was done there was that all the data that you have for the patient, like their oxygen level, or uh, their blood reports, or their chest x-rays. So all this data is feed to an AI platform, which uh, generates a lot of reports and it gives you an ARDS score that what's the probability of this patient going to an ICU condition. And this helps doctors to take decisions very fast, which, is, which uh, initially was uh, delayed because all these reports have to be collected manually, brought it to the doctor and it takes weeks by the time the patient might just go into ICU and might might die. So that was one of the, I think, which really uh, changed my thought or my vision of uh, uh, getting into healthcare because we have, we, we, we spoke to a couple of patients, did interviews, spoke to a couple of doctors, but there was one of the uh, interesting product uh, project that we did with uh, one of the innovation teams. Just to add to that, I would uh, say uh, with this project, one of the learnings is like healthcare is very complicated, first thing. Second thing is uh, you're not validating. So if you validate an idea with a patient for which you're building the product, it's not enough. You have to go validate with insurance. You have to go validate with the doctors. So in this case, we validated it with doctors and the patients, which was great. But now because it's in hospital, you need to create a viability for the hospital management. Why should they invest in a product? So there has to be an angle towards, uh, you know, saving costs for the hospital. And so you have these four or five different stakeholders you're kind of running around. Now, imagine if you, in a healthcare, you start building the product and you don't validate this, how much time, I think they spend around four, easily around three to four years to just build something which can be brought to the market for all, for all these stakeholders and testing. Of course, uh, it was much smaller, slower than the other uh, industries. We were able to do all of this in four to five months, uh, going through these four or five different stakeholders very, very fast. Every every two weeks, we were doing iterations in the design, in prototyping, and going to the doctors, taking their feedback, 
and I think it was very interesting. And and then finally, as we said, this is now there, which is very close to the user need or the user requirement, which can now go into the first version of uh, building building your product. The challenge, the biggest challenge for us was learning this. So when we, I remember when we went to the first call, we didn't have any clue on what ARDS is. What is this lung condition? How does how does a patient go into ICU? What's ventilation? What how does a ventilator work? And these were all like set of ten doctors that were talking to us, and we were we were looking. So it took us like three four days as a team to go through all the YouTube videos and uh, understand okay how this whole thing works. And uh, I think after that we were so confident that we 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 sounded like doctors when we were talking to them, though we were not. So it's, it's really love, challenging uh, usually with uh, tech teams uh, when it comes yeah. to uh, understanding and talking their language. Uh, so sometimes you have to, uh, you know, go a level low, or sometimes you have to go a level high, which which has which is a bit difficult to, you know, simplify uh, talking the same language together. Yeah. So uh, I also personally share another story talk, around. Okay. Uh, okay. In, whenever mm -hmm. we talk about C D P and all. So anything, Manju, we need to do? Sorry, I, uh, was that a question? That was a bit, that was a bit the plan quiet. was to uh, edit close and start the training uh, for uh, UAT. Uh, the setup was done, but there were issues, as I said uh, yesterday as well. So team yeah. is working on that. And uh, yeah, the plan sure. is to close those issues by Monday first half, and then our SMS will actually uh, take a look at it all the uh, because they need to prepare for the training uh, uh, as well once the environment is fixed. So okay. Monday and Tuesday basically they will prepare, and I think Daisy will also look uh, into the environment on uh, Tuesday as well. So that's the reason we we were uh, requesting for training to be moved to Wednesday. Is somebody's phone call? Um, so has it been agreed with the development leads or deployment leads? I guess so, yeah. I guess it was a phone call. I just muted oh, yeah. our guess. No, no worries. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was trying to understand. Speaking <laughs> yeah. um, into someone's other's business. Yeah. Um, so I've, I've just spotted that there's a question on the chat. Um, Hugo, do you want to yeah. do you want, or do you want me to grab it? Go ahead, Steph. Okay. Um, so ha this is from Hernan. Hi, Hernan. Uh, how do you sell or convince a company that you don't consider this valuable to to invest in, in, in on testing? Um, OK, right. I see where you're coming from. So and how much percentage wise do you think we need to invest in this process compared with development? OK, well, uh, yeah, you going to take it or? Yeah, I can. I can think, yeah. I mean, in this case, I think uh, one of the things is, yeah, I mean, management has to have a buy in in experimentation. I think they do understand experimentation. That's what I'm, I'm, I'm coming to. Like uh, they're already used to doing something called of market research, user research. But experimentation kind of gives more data, and this is part of education which needs to happen. That what how is it different from this uh, these uh, these things? So I've, I've spoken to now people who invest a lot of money in folk groups and you know running some surveys and all those kind of things. Which, which we kind of try to educate their opinions coming from the customer. Rather, you need a behavior. Uh, opinion is basically you are trying to look into a crystal ball and say what is going to happen tomorrow. That's not going to be true. What you need to really know is uh, you need to kind of go to uh, actual behavior, uh, whether they are actually putting money on the table, whether they're putting time on the table for you when, they, when you're presenting the, uh, presenting the, you know, whatever you're trying to test the feasibility, viability, desirability kind of things. So, so Najee, just one question to that point. So obviously human behavioral science is something that has, has seen exponential rise recently. Do you think that there's an overlap with what you're doing of more incorporation of, of uh, neuroscience and human behavioral science into your, your processes? And also additionally to your point before, um, you know, companies for so long have have really focused on time efficiency. OK, or how do we get an answer from A to B? And we've lost that opportunity to explore and and to test hypothesis. Um, and do you think that there's a massive cultural shift for corporate businesses to move away from being focused, so focused on let's fix the, the problem, A to B efficiency, go, 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 to really kind of almost retrofitting from the big problem what, where where would perfect be? How do we get there? Let's experiment to get there. 
Um, I think in this scenario, uh, yes, there is kind of, uh, I would say, uh, this behavioral science and uh, uh, what we're talking about is kind of linked to this. The reason is uh, you will eventually get an answer. I mean, that's something which, which needs to be understood. You will eventually get an answer. The, the experimentation only helps you get those answers as a first step. What you're trying to do is you will build a product. Let's say that's the scenario you're going to take. You start building the product. You put six months, eight months into it. You go to the market. You will, you will spend some dollar values on marketing. You'll get some users to use it, but they will not be active. They will just come there. They will see it and they will never return. Now you'll start hunting. What's happening here? Why are they not using my product? Why are they not coming back? And then you start trying to get the answers, which you can easily get without writing a single line of code early on. And the second part of this is that uh, uh, one of the convincing areas around convincing your management is that, see, most of them, I mean, if I, if I pick up the data, you get $1 billion idea out of 250 if you go and check the VC data, very simple. So, uh, uh, so if you only invest in, let's say, 10 ideas or 20 ideas, uh, testing, uh, let's say, it'll take you decades to get there, get there. So how can you move faster? How can you go through these 250 to get that one, which will bring you a billion dollar right? Test, yeah. it's gonna be two months, three months testing. And you, you have those, you know, you can test easily around 50 to 100 ideas in that space. And then you just need to scale up testing. And if you can scale up testing, and these are small investments done on a lot of ideas, we, most of them will be killed. Yes, we know that, but we'll be failing very, very cheaply, very, very fast to reach the ones which are gonna give us returns. And that's what we see at a buyer. I mean, we, we have really tested and we've gone through this three year of journey, which is 400 ideas is what they started on the top of the funnel. And they have 25 products left over at the end, uh, out of which 17 went back to the core and now they have a billion dollar uh, revenue, new revenue coming from that. Now, this is, this is what, what they've published, at least. I don't know what is the reality, but this is what they've published uh, in this. But this is, this is possible. Uh, the thing is, they ex what, what they did really well is they uh, really scaled up their, uh, uh, their testing. Uh, so they were testing hundreds of ideas a year. And they were but, killing and see, this, is some, this, is not, this is something which is not uh, a, a rocket science, because if you see the culture of... Uh, Amazon or Google, this is what they do. Like one of my friends worked for Amazon and he's work, he was working on Alexa. And we know, okay, Alexa is out, right? It's market. But there are 10 such Alexa products which are going inside Amazon, which nobody knows. And it's so chaotic that all these small teams are just experimenting and trying to build something. And of course, you do 50 to 100 experiments, but only you see, you only see the top, uh, you know, products coming out, but then there are so many products which are being experimented internally that, uh, that, that comes out, right? more like learning from them and uh, implementing it in your companies. I think the challenge for innovation is what we have learned is every organization is at a different stage. Like if you see buyer today, I think initially the, the stage they started was at the learning stage that, okay, let's learn how we can innovate. Because if you talk to a couple of companies, uh, most of them are like typical R&Ds, tech driven innovation. When it comes to, okay, marketing, oh, no, 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 we are not the right people to talk to. You should go to the marketing department. So I think it's now changing. In fact, I was talking to one guy yesterday in uh, Sao Paulo. So, uh, and he brought it very, very, uh, very effectively that now innovation is not like tech innovation, but it's uh, it's more more driven by marketing now, right? This is how we can use yeah. marketing, how we can use uh, you know uh, smart hacks to really go and test our ideas. So it's it's uh, so I think uh, to answer that question, how we sell and convince, uh, it's more. A, our first approach is to see where this company is sitting at which stage. And based on the stage, we say, okay, that maybe you're not ready right now, so we are not the right partners for you. But when you get ready and you want to really experiment, even if you want to do your first experiment, call us and we'll help you. And if you're really into the products, yes, product is already there. But that's, as I said, you know, all the roads still go to Rome, but you need to find the fastest way and the cheapest way to reach there. I would say everybody who's sitting on front of the computer, you want to see the failure rate, uh, search Google graveyard, exactly. or there is Microsoft more. Yeah, Microsoft. Okay. It's a very good, very good website. In, 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 <laughs> we have a very yeah. pragmatic question here. Talking about experiments, how much money should you spend or what percentage probably of the budget or how much marketing should be done for a landing page to validate the problem? So how much should you spend of your time, budget, availability, whatever, to uh, come up with experiments? So we have seen uh, uh, like teams are spending anything between, uh, let's say 
an average of uh, let's say anything between 1000 to 2000 per experiment uh, in euros and they are able to run around five to eight experiments for 10k uh, or or if they want to go more aggressive towards the aggressive teams usually spend around uh, 20k so they double it and they run around 15 experiments uh, in this scenario uh, we are working on something which is uh, which is uh, almost finished here so every experiment can have like will bring a data point uh, so we are trying to create a formula where uh, if you plug in your data points uh, for each and every experiment there is a probability meter we are kind of building on which is it starts with 10% if you have a positive result outcome it goes to 30 but if it again so the third experiment is uh, let's say negative which is not meeting your goal it pushes you back to the uh, 10% mark so it keeps on going in and we have tested it few few teams and we see that uh, they get to see the right business model or or the right problem and customer segment around at least 9 to 10 different experiments they have to run to go go there so small bets right small so, bets de risking they are very uh, so they are like i think weekly experiments but uh, i think if if you remember one of the slides where i mentioned that you have to have at least six to seven experiments which can go more depending on how what do you want to test or what's your assumption so if you're going with say one or two problems you can test it with five six experiments but if you really want to see the results coming out uh, uh, you know the evidence it has to be over a period of time you know different continents different places people behavior will change how they adapt to your product how they adapt to the problems that will change so a lot of things get together but uh, yeah and and i think from a cost perspective what we have done is uh, uh, in, uh, so we have a package where we say okay you can take uh, uh, i think what uh, five experiments were not wrong right it's it's like for 10000 euros which you can pick up and then choose so based on which stage if you see the infographic remember that so we if what stage you are but most of them are actually at the validation of problem and uh, and, uh, and customer segment so you have these experiments you can pick and choose and quickly run and as you grow you scale up your data so you start with the uh, minimum testable high you know number and then as and when you're growing your experiments will change uh, so that's how it usually goes so if i split this on uh, very uh, from a corporate level i would say they are spending uh, testing one business idea around 50k uh, how it split is usually uh, around 20 to 30k goes into uh, mentoring coaching learning so it's more of educational mentoring piece coaching, yeah. so teams are coming from corporate so they need to be educated so there is a like strategizer or uh, academy for corporate entrepreneurship we work with these guys would do the coaching they have e learning courses certifications around lean startup so a lot of theory and then for execution of experiments they will spend another 10 to 20k so this is how they split this uh, 50k once right. the I- yeah sorry sorry please go ahead sorry Najit. once they are uh, done with that so they now let's say there are 20 ideas they test they will come back to three to four ideas which actually make sense for them to further invest so this in this they will put around uh, 150 to 200k uh, investment per idea in which they will develop a product and then they'll bring some, bring it to the market acquire some early users uh, make them active and they will t- also try to test uh, uh, can they convert them into paid users so they don't scale up the product because that comes later right now you're trying to p- pick up around 20 to 30 users 40 users to use the product understand how they are behaving get the data analytics on the on on place in place just answering all those unknowns around you know how are you going to so product market fit unknown questions and this is the investment around 150 to 200k they they spend testing with early adopters before investing a lot of money trying to yeah. jump to the late majority yeah. Yeah. we we've had here uh, you talked about strategizer tendai viki was uh, one of our guests uh, recently right. he talked about many, many of these things uh, in talking about um, entrepreneurship there's a question here asking while we are voting or using the dot voting technique how do we overcome the founders bias for our product in what is important? It's a very good question. I know the pain. <laughs> this, is a, this is a typical, uh, this is a very political uh, question. And yes, uh, and that's the reason this process has been created. So it's, uh, it, so usually what happens is in the, in this ideation process, this is how, you know, you call it the hippo culture where the management tries to push their ideas, right? And, and that's in fact, when we were doing our surveys, a uh, long time back, we've been trying to validate the whole thing. This was the biggest problem that came on the table. Uh, I think the solution is, uh, uh, as such, no, but with these, uh, you know, uh, like the vote, this whole framework that you see, so it's no talking framework. So what you're doing is you are, you're, you're just putting your idea on the table, 
taking it uh, and and then there are people voting it so it's more like democracy however uh, it still depends on the organization culture that how how do they really take it in some of the companies when we tried implementing this process it really worked it showed value to the employees it showed value to the management as well however in some companies uh, which are more uh, management driven uh, hippo driven yet yes it becomes difficult so it, it's but you slowly take so always you know changes are always uh, changes takes time so you have to start with some step start implementing it maybe uh, go agile put it in one team one small team start building that culture and once these teams go out and work in other teams they will they will adapt the culture well I'll, i'll take an analogy here which i usually explain it to founders it's like uh, like you you're getting into a relationship really so you don't go and you know ask the uh, the person to marry you on on the first date so you go date you get to know the person that's your experimentation right there is it is it the right fit for me is it something which i can go further with should i go for a second date what does the data, you know what does my feeling or the data says so you continue to do that and then you go and you know change your uh, relationship level uh, and put more investment now okay, when it comes to breakup the longer you are you have been in a relationship the breaker will break up will be much more much more difficult for you it's the same thing which is which which happens that last 6 months of your relationship if you're in a relationship for a long time you're there just because you feel it might get better so you're in last 50k or 100k or 200k what you spend on your product without killing it it's just you already know it that it's not going to work but you still spend it just maybe it works maybe the next day would be better so the, the longer the more investment the, no, the more time the more cost you're going to put in your idea it's going to be difficult to break up so you need to kind of you know that's why you're trying to be emotionally detached early on and uh, and then experiment is a good way to do that uh, you and, and to i think we created a process around this which was called alignment sprint because a lot of uh, you know people we spoke to this was one of the biggest problems they said okay how do we align with the management you know where they are not pushing their ideas but there is a democracy where we can also put our ideas together uh, i am not i'm trying to find the link but uh, i'm not sure devansh uh, if you're there on the call if you can share that alignment sprint link might be helpful for people to go through it and then use the framework to align with the management on all these ideas we have another good question here by uh, felipe v gregorio the process was uh, the, the process was sequential evaluating multiple ideas before developing the solution the innovation pipeline right so many tech companies have a more mature development pipeline and in innovation pipeline so what are the pros and cons of following an idea experimentation process before developing compared to dev teams having continuous experimentation to their development process so if i understand that question correctly it's uh, so there are two like experimentation is a little bit confusing when it comes to like there is business model experimentation which happens that product doesn't exist you're trying to validate first before you build and there is an experiment which you do directly on the product uh to have because one thing which you need to understand everybody needs to understand experiment experimentation never stops it is always going to be part of your life because the, wherever whichever stage you are in you will have a next unknown which you want to validate so you want to kind of uh, uh, build an experiment around that so now uh, if it's on the product that's uh, so most of the most of the time what you're trying to do is you're trying to improvise your funnel uh, so that's more towards experimentation around growth uh, which which you do on the product and that's what i think uh, this question is about what the pros and cons of following an idea experimentation process before developing compared to dev teams adding continuous experiment to you so yeah i mean this is i think it's uh, if it doesn't exist you kind of do these marketing experiments which uh, got of shared earlier but if you are on the product you already have a product you like booking.com you would you would go and see you know uh, they have these uh, uh, 30 more people are viewing this property or we just you know you just missed this property that property they ha- all of these are experiments on the product so that you probably uh, you know if hugo and i are looking at uh, the the product and opening this booking.com we might have a different view because we are probably in different customer segment for them and they will be running some experiments on that and from the interviews i've done with them they run around thousands of experiments on the product directly uh, every year and uh, this is just they're checking how many people are responding to this experiment they they have this closed uh, goal on the product this is a totally different science which which happens on the product both so are, both are important both are important yeah. based so, on where you so are 
so in terms of uh, you know this this whole experimentation is so don't take don't think like it's a, it's, a, it's an isolation it's integrated with the whole process so the examples that we gave were more for innovation teams where they're uh, doing the existing product but if you remember the quarter and trend you're focusing on your existing product with existing problems then that fits well with your existing uh, you know features so for example you want to build one x feature now the approach of uh, uh, you know uh, product development is okay let's write a user story let's define the acceptance criteria let's put all the estimation together and start building it and launch it but if you see the experiment approach what you can do is before launching it and building it you quickly build a simple ux how is the user going to interact with that feature put some fake buttons there and you 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 just want to measure okay how many people really go on that uh, you know feature how many clicks do they do what uh, what are what and what did they really click and and put put that in your product bundle it launch it collect the data and and see and decide uh, based on your success criteria as you see uh, so the same framework can be used for your existing products as well and based on that you decide okay should i build this feature or should i not build this feature we we have another good question here in probably the last one we are running up out of time which is good yeah. a lot of people a lot of interest good topic so the question is about fake checkout in experiments how do you make fake checkout when your brand value is very high and it can affect your brand negatively it's a good one well that's uh, mm -hmm. yeah so in this case uh, i think uh, we do off brand test Uh, very very simple answer. Uh, so uh, when a buyer or Airbus or these companies when they're working with us, we ask them, do you want to do brand? Uh, you want to share the brand or you want to do off-brand testing? Whenever there is an off-brand testing, we are the startup. It, it it has nothing to do with the Everything, corporate yeah. company. So you just do an off-brand testing. The second thing which I would add is it's kind of some people also question this ethical uh, part of you know you're lying to me. Uh, or you're lying to the user. So this is, I think, it's it depends on where you are. I mean, what we do is we, when we are trying to do, let's say, a fake checkout or also this fake button, uh, what we do is we try to create something very, very small, which can still help the user. It could be like, you know, you're trying to uh, improve your life in a particular area. I don't know. I mean, whatever that area is, let's say health, uh, you want to improve your health. We're not automating anything which will help you, but we might create a, You know, these are the 10 points you can, like a checklist, 10 points which you can uh, improve your health with. It's nothing. It's just a very simple, simple PDF or something. We're not solving a problem. I know they click a button expecting something else, but we give a very small gift or you can say it's to cover that ethical ground. Like, you know, at least give you something uh, back to, to the user for clicking that button. So this is what we try to do. And uh, yeah, off-brand. Actually, yeah, uh, that's, it depends on the ideas. In fact, uh, what happens is with the brand, a lot of companies decide, okay, we'll not use a brand. And in fact, I was reading one of the articles that, so for example, uh, I, I launched a product X, uh, uh, say with Amazon. Now people are so obsessed with Amazon that if you're running your experiment with your own brand, then people might just go with your uh, product because it says Amazon. So I think that the, even the data that you collect while experiments might not give you the real picture because you want to see that people really go with the product or they really go with the brand. So it's usually... Uh, when you're in the innovation phase and you're testing ideas, it's always recommended not to go with the brand, uh, stay away from the brand. And a lot of these, a lot of uh, new ideas that we do with the companies, they usually what they do is they they pick up a product name and then that becomes a logo. And then you see it because uh, when you're going to the users, you're going to the users uh, uh, with zero bias. You don't want to bias them with the brand. And and that's where you start. Uh, you give get the real stuff or the real data. A startup has to be a startup. So you, imagine it's a startup. Us within the organization, within the enterprise, uh, and but it has to be like a startup. Treat like a startup. Treat it like a startup. Steph, do you want to wrap up? Perfect. I think Steph is mute, muted. <laughs> um, I think someone needs to do a song called "I Can't Find the Meat Button." Oh, guys, they, that was absolutely fantastic, and it's been really insightful. Also. On a, from a personal perspective, it's always great to talk about marketing and brands because, you know, that's that's my my sweet spot on in innovation, particularly, um, you know, they are, you know, brand marketing people seem to kind of miss the curve. The innovation is actually leading because we're directly talking to consumers and people. And that's the place that we should really start innovation. Yep. Um, so. So, yeah. So, guys, thank you so much. It's been fabulous. 
thanks everyone and yeah appreciate that and thank yeah you. let's continue yeah. let's see what we can add more value so we'll see, we'll, we'll see you in future thanks everyone Hope to see you all in tomorrow. Sorry, today we have another session at 6 p.m. Oh, yeah. London time yeah. with, with Michael Sack. Uh, so hope to, to see you all in PS. Michael was the father and inventor of a famous game called Command and Conquer Red Alert. I spent a lot of money playing that game. Probably you guys as well. So don't, don't miss the session later in, in, in the day. Thank you all and have a nice evening or a nice day. Yeah, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.